should have mentioned also that, uh, I mean, I always love it when uh, we have somebody who's, I mean, since this is such a New York institution, to have somebody who's, you know, been in the city for such a long time and is so much uh, woven into the musical fabric of this city. So, Warren, thank you for that also. Absolutely. Um, well, you know, let's talk about Shout. I mean, it's a really interesting record, you know. A, I mean, it's, it's obviously very strong musically, but the concept for it is also very interesting. You know, you have, uh, you know, the government mule, uh, you know, all of you guys, you know, playing songs, and then you have, you know, a number of guests, you know, you have Dave Matthews, uh, Elvis Costello, you know, Grace Potter, Steve Winwood, uh, Dr. John, you know, all singing these songs. Now, you know, government mule is a pretty good singer to begin with. Um, I wonder what your thinking was about, uh, you know, bringing in, uh, you know, these guests to, to interpret these songs. Well, we had taken a year off for the first time in our career, which was uh, a good thing. Uh, it, it allowed us all to have some perspective that we might not have had otherwise, um, and think about what kind of record we wanted to make. But we didn't come up with the concept of Shout until we were in the middle of making the record. It started with three songs in particular that were very different for us. Uh, the first one was Funny Little Tragedy that I had written uh, in California when I was out there with Phil Lesh. And I knew when I wrote the song that it reminded me of like the attractions or the clash or something very dissimilar to anything Government Mule had ever done. I didn't even think of it as a Government Mule song. Can you talk a little bit about the, about the inspiration? What made you move in that direction or where did that come from? You know, I always say that uh, unless I'm writing for a project, then I'm just writing for the sake of the song. I get an idea and whatever that idea is, I just try to tackle it. Uh, on its own merit and see what happens and then decide later if it belongs to any of these entities. You know, a lot of the songs I write maybe don't even fit into any of them, which is hard to believe that all the, <laughs> all the different projects I have that I still write songs that don't belong in any of them. But I, I thought maybe Funny Little Tragedy was that kind of song. I thought, well, maybe I'll do it on a solo record or, you know, I, I just, I really liked the song but I didn't think of it as a mule song until I showed it to the guys. And they're like, no, oh, we can totally put our thing on that and it'll be a government mule song. And, and uh, I was like, okay. Um, so we recorded it about midnight one night, thinking that we were just learning the song and that we weren't under the pressure of keeping anything because we, we barely knew the song. Uh, and I think in our minds, we were gonna come back the next day or a week later or something and, and actually record it for keeps. But we liked the version that we recorded at midnight when everybody was drinking wine and, and uh, it was- uh, Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was, I was wondering how to clarify that. Um, so uh, it's that third dot that gets you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I know, you're fine with the first two. <laughs> so, um, but I think when we listened back to it, we thought that it had that un uninhibited quality that great rock music has that you really are better off capturing when you don't know the tape is rolling. And I, I think we all know through the years, we've gotten better and better at recording and knowing how to block out of your mind the fact that the tape is rolling, but it still doesn't change the fact that we're more comfortable on stage than we are in the studio. Um, so we listened back to it and thought, it sounds like a take, we should keep this. Um, so I had been uh, conversing mostly through email with Elvis Costello uh, since hanging out uh, in Australia at this festival we were doing together. And it turns out he and I have a lot more in common than some people might expect. I, I was uh, pretty certain we probably would because I'm a big fan of his and I kind of know what his influences are and stuff. But um, I decided to email him and get his uh, opinion on how to go about getting a, an era-specific vocal sound, a, a vocal sound that sounded like that period of time. 
And so he emailed me back this really long letter uh, on my aim is true, I did this, on this album I did that, and all this different stuff. But he said, long story short, you really should use a really cheap microphone. <laughs> but, because he said on those early records, their budgets were so low, they went into these cheap studios, made records really quick, and they didn't have any expensive microphones. And so I said, okay, I'll try that. And, and I, it worked, and I called him back and said, that was great. Uh, but from that point forward, I started thinking about him singing the song. But we still had not made the, the decision to have any guests at that point. Then Danny and I had written this song called Stoop Solo, that we wrote in honor of the 40th anniversary of Sly and the Family Stone uh, Fresh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, after we recorded it, I put a vocal on it and listened back to it, and somehow it reminded me of Dr. John, and Dr. John was going to be on tour with us a couple of weeks later, so that seed started getting planted. And then Toots Hibbert had called me about playing and singing on the new Toots and the Maytals record, and I'm a big fan, so I obviously agreed. And uh, one of the last songs we worked up for the record was this song called Scared to Live that, that Danny and I wrote together as a ballad. We wrote like, it was like this McCartney-ish sort of ballad. It was not a reggae song. But we went into the studio and our uh, co-producer, Gordy Johnson, convinced us that it should be a reggae song. And in the beginning, we were kicking and screaming. We didn't want to change the way we had originally written it. And uh, I even put it on the back burner and said, well, we'll come back to it later. And when we came back to it later, it became a reggae song. And I loved it. I really loved and it. And Tits's reading of it is really just amazing. Because there's also, there's these pop and rock sensibilities in the song. It's not just typical traditional reggae. So I was a right. little curious, how's he going to deal with that part of it? You know, and Toots and I have known each, each other for a long time, but... And he's uh, the greatest Jamaican soul singer alive, you know. But I didn't know how he was going to fare at the, the more rock kind of sections of the tune. And it was such a pleasant surprise hearing him do it. Uh, but prior to making that decision, we were now we're faced with these three choices. Uh, do we bring these guys in to sing? Uh, originally, we were just going to have them do a cameo. And then it seemed stupid to have singers of this stature only sing a small part of the song. So we said, let's let them sing the whole song, and then maybe we'll create a bonus alternate version. Uh, and once that happened, I said, you know, let's just do that for every song. And so I s sat and made a list of every song and who other than myself I would love to hear sing it and started making phone calls. You know, I think that one of the things about it that's so interesting is that it really, it's sort of like you get the album and then you get a kind of interpretation of the album you know it's you know it's kind of a whole package and i wonder you know what your sense was you know when you I, I don't know have you sat down to listen to the whole thing straight through like i've sat down and listened to just the bonus yeah straight through uh and i love it i, I just uh i'm really enamored with what everyone did um and Everyone asked me, uh, were you scared that somebody might like so-and-so's version better than yours? Absolutely not. I, I like a lot of them better than mine, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, these are a lot of my absolute favorite singers, and in some cases, people that I was very influenced by. And it's such an honor as a singer and as a songwriter to hear these folks interpret our music. Um, especially like with Toots and with Steve Winwood and with Dr. John, I find myself live now singing the song more like they did, like just by accident, you know, just because I've listened to it and it's kind of growing on me. Well, the, the Steve Winwood uh, track also has, just has that kind of beautiful kind of late period traffic feel of being very, um, I don't know, you know, just kind of very evocative and, and moody and, you know, uh, you know, and obviously the band version is great, but then when, when his voice comes in, there's this this quality of like almost hearing what, you know, that was somewhere in your mind, you know, yeah. kind of. And it and was. Uh, I even told Steve when I called him, uh, I, I called Steve after we had made the decision to add these guests, 
and uh, he, he was in London and, and he was driving. And he's like, oh, uh, Warren, I, I need to pull over, I'm, I'm driving. <laughs> and I thought of the difference in culture. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> oh, I could text you, that, if that's easier. Yeah, well, like, A, <laughs> we don't pull over right. to take a phone call. Uh, we just endanger people's lives. Uh, <laughs> Precisely. And <laughs> it's the American way. <laughs> um, but I told him, uh, I said, you know, I, I was kind of thinking traffic when I wrote this song. It's, it's odd, uh, this song, When the World Gets Small. It's the first song that I ever wrote on piano because I recently bought a piano to make myself learn enough piano to just at least write songs on a different instrument. Uh, and I'm the worst piano player probably in this room. Uh, but I, when I was writing it, my piano skills are so limited that I'm sure I was thinking uh, of Steve or traffic in my head and trying to figure out, you know, some of those maneuvers. But, uh, and I confessed that to him, hoping that it wouldn't turn him against the song. But uh, he was kind enough to record it and, it, and it just brings the whole thing full circle for me because not only is he one of my favorite all-time singers, uh, we've become good friends through the years, but uh, the song was written with his influence, so that's, that's a, an extreme honor for me. And also a phenomenal guitar player. So. Yeah, and organist yes. and, uh, and human being, a really sweet human being. Um, I wanted to ask you about the song uh, World Boss on the, on the album, you know, because it, uh, I don't know, maybe just the moment when it came out, when you know, just have all this business is going on with, uh, obviously our government is shut down at the moment, uh, and uh, you know, we're you know, potentially on the verge of some kind of you know, economic uh, cataclysm, depending on uh, whether or not you believe actual economists. Uh, as I many people seem not to, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, you know, I wonder what you know what your thinking was, you know, coming up with that song because it, it it very much seems of the moment, even though obviously you wrote it, you know, before any of this particular stuff started going on. Well, a lot of stuff was starting to happen, um, and I think what happens a lot of times with songwriters is you write about something when it's first starting to trickle not knowing if it will explode or not, and in some cases it does, and you turned out to be right. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of things already bubbling, uh, and, and after, after we recorded World Boss and, and uh, some journalists started hearing it, I was in Germany, and every journalist I talked to started talking about the the NSA and the wiretapping and and all this stuff uh, and it was amazing to get a sense of other countries view of where America is at the moment and uh, that song is very vague you can interpret it in a lot of different ways uh, and it's not there's it's a short lyric so there, there's not a lot of information there but it's uh, the presence that it advertises is uh, a scary one. And, yeah, uh, I mean, there's a, I mean, I don't know, my read of it was, you know, sort of something like Big Brother or, you know, this, this sense that when, when, there's, uh, when there's a lot of chaos and a lot of, you know, and, you know, things don't seem to be functioning the way they ought to function, you know, there's a real danger of, you know, the emergence of, of uh, you know, these kind of, a fascist, I guess, figures, not to put too fine a point on it. Yeah. And, and an odd kind of part of that uh, story is that the term world boss came to me in a much more humorous setting. We were in Jamaica, uh, Government Mule plays Jamaica every January, and I started, uh, <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> For, uh, yeah, I noticed on your website, you're closing, uh, I guess, this uh, the last date anyway that was listed that was in the grill. Which, uh, we was, uh, we take over this resort and have the same <laughs> nice. crowd every night for uh, four shows right on the beach. It's wonderful. But So that's where I got the term, was a lot of the locals use the term world boss, and it can be used in affection 
it basically means you're a bad dude. But it's uh, if dude was a longer word. Uh, uh, but I started here. They go. That's the world boss there, and they were. T it was a compliment, and so, and then somebody would go, no, no, that's the real world boss there, and then I had my son with me. He was a year, a year old or a little, a little older at the time, and and uh, one of our friends that's a local said, that's the real world boss, <laughs> and that's what made me grasp onto the term. But then I thought, okay, what character is that gonna evoke? And it's gotta be some really scary thing that, uh, and then I look around in the news at what's going on and like a lot of people, you know, people refer to us as the world police a lot, but that's not as cool of a song title. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, I, uh, I can't help but notice that there's a guitar over there. And uh, yeah. I wonder if you could, um, uh, as you play it, maybe talk to us about, uh, you know, songwriting. I mean, because obviously, you know, we've talked about it a bit now. And, you know, obviously you write in a lot of different ways and a lot of different contexts. I wonder if you could, you know, maybe select a song and talk a little bit about you know, its origins and how you came to it and how it became uh, to be what it is and, and maybe you can play it for us. Sure, I'd be happy to. Hello. So uh, the song that I was talking about earlier, When the World Gets Small, that I wrote uh, on piano, I had to, when we got into the studio, I, I didn't want to play piano on it, so I had to show Danny Lewis my part and let him uh, make it better. And then I had to figure out how to play it on guitar, which I had never done. Uh, Turns out it sounds pretty cool on guitar, too, thankfully. But uh, a lot of times when I'm writing a song, uh, I guess the, the easiest way for me to uh, uh, break it down is that a lot of the mid-tempo and slow songs start off with a lyric first, and then th that lyric starts turning into a melody and then I start writing music uh, around the melody. The up-tempo songs tend to start out with some sort of guitar riff or hook uh, and I usually wind up writing the, the lyrics later. But I've been challenging myself recently to not fall into any patterns so a lot of the songs uh, on the new record I would do the opposite. Uh, I would take a a lyric and turn it into an up-tempo song or vice versa, but this is uh, When the World Gets Small as interpreted on guitar. When the world gets small Feel like it's closing in Through it all There's you My friend When I feel like I can't go on No reason to aspire Just can't rise above this you Only you 
Voices of a thousand years ringing in my head. But Joyce is the only one cuts through it all. When the world gets small. Traffic on the highway Even more in my head Makes me long for another time and place When life was so much easier And all my friends were still around There was a big smile on my face Yesterday I was flying high High above the crowd But I know I'm gonna need a place to fall small In dreams I'm flying still High above a mountain But I know I'm gonna need a place to fall When the world gets small Should I come back over there? What's that? Should I come back here? Yeah, that would be great. I know I didn't explain much about the process. Um, <laughs> well, I think to do so now, I mean, now that we've had that amazing experience, I have to say, I mean, having done a number of these things, it's always just so extraordinary, you know, to be uh, in a room with an artist like you and, uh, you know, experience close hand, you know, in a, uh, a performance like that. That was just very powerful. Thank you. Uh, with that particular song, I wrote a, a lot of it at the same time as far as meaning the lyric and the melody and the, and the music. Uh, sometimes I may have a lyric sitting around for a long time and not add the music till much later, or, or vice versa. Uh, and a lot of songwriters, I think, feel like when they come quickly, uh, sometimes when they come quickly, it, they turn out to be really good songs, but you're so thankful because it, it is a excruciating process uh, in your mind to kind of just dwell on something over and over and over and change little parts. And um, when they come quickly, it, it's something to be thankful for. Uh, a, a lot of times, you know, I keep a notebook of, of lyrics and my my most favorite way to write recently is to write stream of consciousness and just write pages and pages and pages of stuff and then go back in a different mindset and circle stuff that I like and then start putting it all together and discard the stuff that I don't like. Uh, that's not the way I've always written, but that's the way I like to write now. I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a great technique. I mean, do you ever, I mean, I was, kidding around before when I was introducing you about, you know, just kind of all the things you do. I mean, do you ever suffer from writer's block? I mean, do you ever get stuck? Yeah, I, I, I go months 
sometimes without writing anything. And uh, I would like to say that I'm used to that, but I, it freaks me out every time it happens. I always think, oh, have I written my last song? But inevitably what happens is I get an idea, it's pretty good, I get another idea, it's pretty good, and then the next thing you know I'm working on two or three songs at once, and I go, okay, uh, uh, it's, it's coming back. I like to think that it kind of moves like a sine wave or something. And I always uh, uh, tell people sometimes too that I think as a writer, sometimes our system is on input and we're just soaking stuff up. Absolutely. And then it, at some point you're saturated and it becomes on output, you know. Well, I think I uh, was wondering, I mean, is, is in terms of your uh, kind of level of activity, you know, is that, you know, has that ever become an issue for you? I mean, where you feel like, you know, that you've kind of just been putting so much stuff out there, you know, just being out there is so active where, you know, you, where you think like, I just need to, you know, try to withdraw a little bit or just be able to absorb a little bit more. Or is, you know, or, or does the activity, is it stimulating? Is it, is it something that just kind of, you know, makes you more creative? It's, it's both. It's, uh, it's very stimulating. And I think it, uh, in the long run, it's more creative, but it also creates sometimes, uh, months at a time where I don't really have time to focus on songwriting. And so I know that I do most of my songwriting November, December, January, February. That that's, tends to always be those four months I write like crazy because I have more time to, to myself and to uh, be in an environment where nothing's conflicting you know I like to be uh, I, I, I like to write at like 3 a.m. when everybody else is asleep and uh, I always say that uh, there's that space you can get into right before you fall asleep where some of the filters are removed from your brain and, and stuff starts pouring out and I don't that's the only way I know to how to explain it so I always make myself if I'm really tired and I get an idea, I always make myself get up and write it down. And, and even to the point of, uh, let's see uh, where it goes. You know, if it's gonna take an hour, if it's gonna take 15 minutes, uh, I, I owe it to myself to do that. And what's funny is usually it turns out to be pretty good, but occasionally, I get up the next day and look at something and go, are you kidding me? That is <laughs> terrible. Like, I really, so there's that too, you know? I mean, when you're almost asleep, you get lots of ideas and some of them are great and some of them are not. You know, I was looking as I was, you know, uh, kind of preparing to, uh, to be here this evening. You know, the, the, your, your situation, in a sense, with the Allman Brothers, I mean, you're kind of like, you know, it's like Ron Wood with the Rolling Stone, you know, the eternal, like, new guy in a certain way. I was thinking, <laughs> oh, yeah, right, you know, like, let's the Allman Brothers. Then I saw, like, God, that was like 1989. You yeah. know, that was, uh, you know, could you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the sort of arc? I mean, obviously, you know, you were away from the band for a little while, and, uh, but just, you know, What's the difference now from that, and and you know how did, you know how would you kind of uh, you know, just kind of look back on that so far? It's been such a interesting journey, you know. Uh, my joining of the Allman Brothers came about as a, a result of being in Dickie Betts's band for two or three years. I made one record with him. We wrote a lot of songs together. And during that time period, um, whenever the idea came up in conversation of the Allman Brothers reforming, it was always, that's never gonna happen. It was a resounding no every time. And so I just kind of took everybody at their word and when they called me in uh, at the end of 88 and said we're putting the Allman Brothers back together, I was as surprised as everybody else because I really didn't think they would ever work together again. Um, but I had written the title track to Greg Allman's uh, solo record at that time just before the bullets fly 
and I'd written four or five songs for, uh, for Dickie Betts' record. And so they brought me into the songwriting circle, which was great. I mean, uh, and I think it took a lot of, uh, uh, I don't want to say courage uh, on their part, but a, a lot of, uh, it was a very bold thing to do. Yeah, a certain to, openness to possibility, yeah. you know. And one of the things that I realized, because I was a huge, a huge Allman Brothers fan, uh, always was, but it dawned on me that most bands that someone like myself would have an opportunity to join that you grew up listening to, most of those bands don't need everyone in the band to be equal. But the Allman Brothers kind of does. That band needs every member to be up here and contributing uh, 100%. Why is that? Because that's the way the band started. And to do anything less would be to sell short the original vision of the band. And so I appreciated, and it was one of the reasons that I was uh, drawn to that gig in the first place is because, you know, I was still the new guy, but musically it was an open discussion. And, and musically I felt like connected and uh, uh, part of it from the very beginning, uh, and that was important to me. You know, and, and I mean, coming into a situation, I mean, you're you, I mean, are are so adept at it. You know, I mean, these bands with you know these extraordinary histories, and you know, also just a very high degree of um, well, audience devotion and audience expectation. You know, obviously thinking about the dead here as well, and, and you know the various you know with Phil Lesh and the different permutations that you've been involved with there. You know, to what degree, I mean, obviously that, that history is a tremendous um, inspiration, I'm sure. Uh, you know, is it ever you know, kind of intimidating or a burden or, you know, something that, you know, you try not to think about or do you try to tap into it as, as fully as you can? The intimidating part uh, was much more at the beginning. Uh, and in both cases, working with the Allman Brothers and eventually with, with the dead, uh, the guys made me feel so comfortable by creating this environment uh, based on not, no expectations of me. When I joined the Allman Brothers, no one required me to play more or less like Dwayne Allman. It was like, we hired you. You do what you do. If you want to pay tribute to Dwayne Allman, you do that. If you don't, you don't. But it wasn't like that's what they expected of me. And it was the same years later working with the guys in the dead. They were, uh, especially back then, I think they were probably because it was much more recent that Jerry had passed than it was Dwayne Allman's passing when I joined the Allman Brothers that I think the last thing they really wanted was someone that sounded like Jerry. And, and what I've discovered was uh, working, being able to be on the inside of something uh, as special as the Allman Brothers or, or the Grateful Dead. Um, you, you see that when a band loses any member, but especially a key member like that, that chemistry is gone. And so, the most they can hope for, the most you can hope for, is to stumble upon a new chemistry that rivals the old chemistry. That, that's the, your best mission. Um, and so to try and revitalize or even clone the original chemistry is futile. Nobody wants it, even if you could do it. Uh, so thankfully, uh, they were very encouraging to me from the very beginning. Um, it was intimidating being in the Allman Brothers the first year or so because I had so much respect for Dwayne Allman as a musician. Um, but the audience uh, kind of embraced the band uh, in 89 pretty quickly. I think partially because 
that was the first time in a long band in, in a long time that the Allman Brothers had kind of gone back to square one and started uh, with what made them great in the first place. If we could get back there, then we can expand, but let's not continue where the band left off when they broke up last. Let's go back to the first three albums and, and rediscover that, you know? And, and so a lot, of, uh, a lot of it I attribute to Alan Woody as well, who was such a strong presence and brought back the... Uh, <laughs> the uh, because people tend to take the bass player for granted. Barry Oakley was such a huge part of the sound of the Allman Brothers. Um, and once I got to know everybody, I realized that uh, he was a big part of it uh, as far as creatively uh, as well. But Alan Woody brought that spirit back into that music, you know, and so a lot of the credit w would go to him. And, and uh, But we came up from the very beginning in 89, that chemistry was strong and the audience embraced it. And uh, I think that's the reason the band chose to, to keep going because when I got hired to do a reunion tour, uh, I, didn't think, I didn't think we were gonna do anything beyond that. You know, you know obviously setting aside enormous talent and uh, you know, incredible gifts as a, as a player and, and, and songwriter, uh, you know, People with those gifts, you know, might not have been able to uh, necessarily function well in, in a situation like that. I wonder if you've, you know, given much thought to just kind of like uh, the personality traits or the, the qualities of you as a person, uh, not not only as a musician, but just as a, you know, as a human being that enabled you, you know, to get inside. Yeah, you know, situations that have been pretty fractious over the years, and and volatile. Yeah, to say so, <laughs> um, and and you know, and then thrive within them, and and help bring out the best in, in everybody else who's around you. Well, it definitely required some patience, and uh, <laughs> I hope, thankfully, I, I inherited that from my father. Uh, my my father instilled patience in in, in me and, and my two brothers. Um, but I also attribute a lot of it to the fact that I had almost three years of working with Dickie Betts prior to sure. joining the Alma Brothers because by the time they asked me to join the band, Dickie and I had gotten really good at playing together and we weren't just starting that guitar tandem relationship. We had honed it in pretty good and, and so that allowed the band to start at a higher level than if they had just auditioned me and chose me and said, okay, the, you're in the band. Um, because the sound of the Allman Brothers is so, so much built around the two guitar interplay, it's such an important part of the sound. So for us to have a step up in that manner, I think was a, a big deal. Um, it was also less intimidating because I had been playing with Dickie uh, for three years. I'd gotten to know him. Uh, I was getting better at, at translating as a musician to a bigger stage, which is a, is a threatening thing. If, you, if you've been playing in small places and then all of a sudden you're playing arenas. And also, I mean, you were somebody who was able to move between you know, what had been the two camps, you know, yeah. pretty, uh, you know with, a, with a certain amount of grace. Well, and, and having had written songs for both camps, uh, Dickie Betts and Greg Allman at that time, that gave me uh, a comfortability factor as well. And, and, uh, but I think about Alan Woody's position that he auditioned and the next day you're in the Allman Brothers. And that is in, that's what would be intimidating to me because I had the three years of, uh, let's call it, um, initiation. <laughs> he, he didn't have that. <laughs> he joined the band and, and uh, was instantly thrown into the fire. Well, you know, you, you've brought up, you know, Alan Woody a couple of times. I mean, obviously, you know, his death was a, was a, a very significant blow to you personally and 
you know, to Government Mule at the time. I wonder if you could talk about, uh, you know, the process at that time of coming to grips with it and, and deciding to go on with the band. I know, speaking for myself, and, I, and for the most part, I can speak for Matt Apps, uh, our drummer, as, as well. Um, my first reaction to Woody's passing was that that was the end of Government Mule. There was no desire to continue, no reason to continue. Um, and the last thing I wanted to do was to try and, and uh, take something that he was such a big part of and redesign it. Uh, but I got a lot of encouragement from people, um, you know, f close friends and, and musicians that I respected, but specifically and most importantly, people that had lost partners or band members, you know. The, I remember the first two phone calls I got were from Greg Allman and from Phil Lesh. And that instantly helped put things into perspective. Um, you know, Phil called me and said, you know, uh, I'm so sorry. I know what it's like to lose someone with whom you have a profound musical relationship. And uh, that really started me thinking, you know, but I got, uh, started hearing from friends in widespread panic, they had just lost, my, lost Mike Hauser. Uh, John Popper and the guys in Blues Traveler had just lost Bobby Sheehan. But I also heard from James Hetfield about losing Cliff Burton and uh, from Dave Grohl about Kurt Cobain passing. And everybody dealt with it in their own way, and some people stayed together and some people didn't. But everybody said the same thing. It doesn't feel like you can go on, but you have to. And you gotta, you gotta keep the music uh, alive. And, and it, you know, it all sounds stupid and cliche, but when somebody is telling you that in such a heartfelt manner, it, it, uh, it kind of penetrates. And, and I started thinking about things differently. It took me about three months to open my mind to the, uh, the new beginning, you know, and, and uh, it was time for us to make a record. And so we would have meetings with uh, management and our producer at the time, Michael Barbiero, and, and uh, myself and Matt. And somebody would bring up, so, you know, if you guys were gonna make a record, who would you want to play bass? And I was kind of being a smart ass. I would say, well, on this song, I would want Jack Bruce, and on this song, I would want John Entwistle, <laughs> and on this song, I would want Bootsy Collins, and on, the, you know, and, and so, that was kind of a running joke. And about the third time I said it, we just started thinking, so let's do that. Let's start. <laughs> Make some calls. Uh, let's, <laughs> and which I guess leads us to shout, right? Because uh, in an odd sort of way, we're celebrating ourselves now. We're not celebrating a loss, but we're celebrating that next year is our 20th anniversary. And so shout is a <laughs> celebration. <laughs> Well, let's see what we have here. <laughs> yes. Oh, Hi. by all means. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me, sir. There's a cutoff point. Uh, that's right. Exactly. Um, uh, let's see. Um, let's go. Uh, this is kind of the something that you know the sort of thing we haven't really covered. So let's take this one from Steve. Um, hi Warren, here's a gear question. So as a guy who is well known as a Gibson man, can you describe what it was like playing Wolf? Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> the Wolf. Um, it was a 
a great honor to have the opportunity to play Wolf on uh, the Jerry Garcia Symphonic Celebration. Uh, <laughs> um, when I first uh, got wind of the fact that the person that owned uh, Wolf was willing to let me use it, in my mind I thought, that, that's awesome, that'll be a perfect addition to the show, the fans will love it, and I'm sure there's two or three songs a night that I'll be able to play it, because you know when, when you're playing an instrument for the first time, it's somebody else's instrument, you may or my, may or may not feel comfortable with it. And then uh, the first night of rehearsal, it showed up in Pittsburgh, and I plugged it in. It sounded incredible, but the sound that it had was so unique and put me closer to Jerry's sound that I would ever have ventured on my own. And that was the time and place to take that step further. And, and uh, then I started playing the guitar, and it felt so natural. I just said, you know what? I, I'm gonna play it on every song. I, I feel extremely comfortable playing this guitar. For that music, it was the, the ultimate instrument. Uh, here's another question, unsigned. Um, <clears throat> originally, Sunshine appeared on Larry McRae's, Soulshine appeared on Larry McRae's Delta Hurricane. It didn't appear on the Allman Brothers album until about five years later and Government Mule album even later. Did you always intend on using it, and did you know when you wrote it that it would become your signature song? Um, interesting story. I wrote Soul Shine in 1987, and uh, I probably should point out now, since we're having this discussion, that when I first wrote it, I was torn between it being uh, a rhythm and blues song or a reggae song. And th that may shock some people, but in 1987 when I wrote that song, I went into the studio to demo it and we played it first as an R&B song and, and second as a reggae song. And I wanted to do it both ways, but we didn't have the time, so we just chose the R&B version because that seemed to be the better fit. Um, so when the reggae version appeared decades later, it was something that had been in my mind for since since the very beginning. Um, it was such a simple song, and still is, that I didn't uh, I didn't think it would have the appeal that it apparently has. Uh, and I even tried to make it more complex. But every time I would do that, it would sound stupid. So I would wind up w with the the simple version. Uh, but it was just a nice little personal song for me. I never really thought much about it. I didn't think of it as an Allman Brothers song uh, until uh, we were in the studio making Where It All Begins, and we, for some reason, were ahead of schedule, and we had recorded every song that we had rehearsed for the record, and we still had studio time left over, and the band was all there. And so somebody said, well, what else do we have? And Greg said, uh, hey man, let's do your song Soul Shine. And I, that was, I knew he had heard it, but that was the first time he had mentioned it as being an Allman Brothers song. And I said, yeah, all right, let's do that. And so we learned it and recorded it in the studio. Prior to that, I had never thought of it as an Allman Brothers song. Uh, but once I heard Greg sing it, it made total sense to me then. Um, the, thank you. The, the reason Government Mule never did it is because it didn't sound good in a trio. So later on when we would add keyboards and stuff, it, it made more sense. Uh, we used to play it acoustically sometimes because it sounded pretty good that way. But, um, you know, I, I'm thankful that uh, a lot of people seem to connect with it because sometimes when you write a song, you know, I guess... It, it's most important that I connect with it. Uh, so if someone else does, that's great. But um, it just always seemed to me like a, a simple little song that uh, we've played so many times now that uh, I think some people are, are sick of it. 
and and I, I think I think I'm sick of it sometimes. But but when we start playing it, the feeling is always good. You know. So. Yeah. <laughs> I always think about the time I asked uh, Richie Sambora if he ever got bored playing Living on a Prayer. And he goes, do you ever get bored getting laid? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good. That, <laughs> One way to think about it. That's a good. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you an interesting story, too, that kind of coincides. Uh, uh, when we first, when the Allman Brothers first started toying with the idea of changing the set list every night because the, the band used to play the same show all the time. And then a few years into me being in the band, some of us started talking about varying the set list. And, and uh, you know, the Grateful Dead had been doing that forever, and, and it seemed to make sense for us. And so myself and Alan Woody and Kirk West, uh, uh, who was the tour manager at the time, and, and, and Greg were all kind of lobbying to do that. And uh, we brought it up in, in a discussion, and, and I think Greg was just looking for me to just be moral support. But he said, uh, he said, hey, Warren, you, you wouldn't be upset if we didn't play One Way Out every night, would you? <laughs> and, and I, I said, you know, no offense, but I was tired of playing that song before I ever met you guys. It's like, uh, I played that song in every bar band, every cover band. <laughs> but here's the difference. When you play it with the Allman Brothers, oh my God, now it sounds like One Way Out. <laughs> like, uh, exactly. Uh, um, here we have a question. This is a good one. Um, you've played with so many legends. Any comments about playing with Mick Jagger at the White House? Uh, it was a, a, an honor. Uh, hearing him and Jeff Beck play together doing a Helen Wolf song was, was terrific. Uh, and at the risk of speaking out of school, the rehearsal version was even better. I, w I got to watch the rehearsal, and the rehearsal, just like we were talking earlier, when, when the tape's not rolling, sometimes things happen, and the rehearsal version of that was awesome. Um, but it was great, and, and uh, you know, he was very warm and friendly to everyone, uh, said, came up one Even to the president? I mean, I was uh, like, oh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, well, he handed him his mic. Yeah, uh, I, I did see uh, that. But, you know, that whole thing, Buddy Guy, B.B. King, and, and, and Jeff Beck, who at that time I had never played with, and, and Beck's one of my all-time favorite guitar players, uh, and being there with Derek and Susan and everybody was just, uh, it was a great experience. And... and uh, I have very fond memories of that. Uh, this is uh, two questions, two parts. How is your baby? And awesome. uh, that's A. B, can you offer a few words of advice for the younger generation as a society, not necessarily musicians only? Well, I'll try and be brief. Uh, <laughs> the, and I'll try and marry the two things together. I think one of the things that's wrong with music and with our society is that marketing has become uh, a superlative of itself. Mar marketing has become something that has to be, it has to grow exponentially. And so we, we are now in a culture that tries to sell something to someone who doesn't want it. And there used to be art forms and music being a, a classic example of people that loved a certain type of music uh, would discover that music and if it appealed to other people as well that's great but when the longevity or the uh, sustainability of a product depends solely on reaching people who would normally not like that product uh, I think we've gone too far you know we're, we're trying to expand every audience to the point that just the people who would rightfully be there are not enough. We have to go beyond that. And, and I think it's, it's hurt us as a society, and I think it's, it's really hurting music. Uh, and your child? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Oh, it's certainly. Uh, you've played with so many great guitarists, but I have to ask, what's it like playing with Eric Clapton? Well, my first three guitar heroes were Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, and Johnny Winter. And uh, Hendrix died when I was 10 years old. I had not even picked up guitar. Uh, he, had, he died before I got my first electric guitar. Um, but I've played with Clapton and I've played with Johnny and both of those things are such full circle uh, issues to me. Um, and, and especially the, what we did uh, at the Beacon when Clapton sat in with uh, the Allman Brothers and then again at the Garden for the Crossroads, it was just really special because we all rose to the occasion and made it what it needed to be. And, and it was such an honor for me. And singing uh, Little Wing with him, singing the duet on Little Wing was amazing too. Uh, and I was so glad because that was uh, an afterthought. We, didn't, we had been talking for months about, uh, not talking, emailing uh, about what songs we were gonna do when he was gonna play six or seven songs with the Allman Brothers at the Beacon. But Little Wing wasn't on the list. And then we rehearsed one afternoon, and we ran through all the stuff. Everything sounded great. And then Eric said, uh, is there anything else we should be thinking about? And we're all just thinking, oh, man, maybe. And he said, what about Little Wing? And we didn't know it as a band, but we all knew it in our memories. Yes. And, and I said, yeah, let's try it. And so we tried it. It sounded great. And we played it. And it was one of the highlights. Uh, it was just beautiful. Um, uh, this is a, a question, uh, obviously, about the Allman Brothers. How did the fallout with Dickie Betts and the band affect you with your relationship with both Dickie and Greg? Well, Dickie is the reason I'm in the Allman Brothers. Dickie Betts brought me into the band. He gave me the biggest opportunity of my career, and uh, that's something that I will never forget. Uh, the falling out between him and, and the, the other partners came about during a time when I had left the band. Um, I left the Allman Brothers along with Alan Woody in, in 97 to concentrate on Government Mule full time. <clears throat> and had, had Woody not passed away, we weren't looking back. We were we were very happy doing what we were doing, uh, and the thought of rejoining the Allman Brothers had never crossed my mind. And so Woody passed in 2000, and uh, I got a phone call from from Greg saying, hey man, I'd, I'd sure love to have you back in the band. And, and uh, it was just a series of circumstances that, that led up to that. Um, so it was it was odd for me and for Derek as well. He and I have talked about it many times. We're both such fans of the original band and what Dickie and Dwayne Allman did together that I think in our minds, we don't even really consider what we're doing. It's hard to say, the Allman brothers because the Allman Brothers to us was what they did in 69, 70, 71. And so we're enormously proud to be an extension of that and part of the journey that's, that's led to where it is. And, and I'm thankful that they chose to keep going. But uh, he and I are such big fans of, of what they did that it was hard for both of us to justify, it's hard to justify the Allman Brothers without Dwayne Allman, but to justify it without Dwayne Allman or Dickie Betts is even that much more difficult. So having said that, uh, we did the absolute best that we could do and, and have created a chemistry with these seven people uh, since 2001 that has reached enormous heights and that we're all extremely proud of and, and 
I defy anybody to walk into the Beacon Theater and listen to the Allman Brothers on a good night and not walk away thinking that was amazing. But, uh, but, but every bit of that is due to what Dwayne Allman and Dickie Betts created. That's a great answer, by the way. Um, and while on the subject, uh, do you have a favorite venue? And what is your favorite <laughs> meal? <laughs> so, this is this from Tom. Um, favorite venue? Well, I, I could say the Beacon because it's the place I've played more than any other. Um, I sure love playing at Red Rocks. That's a, that's a, yeah. uh, uh, but as I've pointed out, a lot when people ask uh, similar questions, it's um, you can have a great show anywhere if there's a great audience. Uh, and then some of it depends on the sound, you know, if, uh, if, it, if it sounds good on stage and you have a great audience, doesn't matter where you are, you can have a great show. Um, I should point out somebody named Eileen wants to swap shirts with you, admiring your shirt. Uh, <laughs> Leave you to your conscience. Uh, uh, so many people have sat, you've sat in with over the years. Is there someone you've never played with that you would love to? Um, and is, and I mean, I'm sure this is too hard, but is there a favorite uh, like person that has sat in with you? Um, well, we talked about the Eric Clapton thing with the Owen brothers. That was special on so many fronts. I mean, it was the first time that Eric had ever played with the Allman Brothers, and so that alone made it very special. His connection with Dwayne Allman. Uh, um, Profound. <laughs> yeah, w without question. Um, it's worded in a way of someone sitting in with us as opposed to me sitting in with someone else. I would else. feel comfortable taking it wherever you want uh, to go. <laughs> it's just like, I don't think we need um, to be contained by the question. We've had so many wonderful people sit in, uh, and, and we could start with people that are no longer with us, like Willie Dixon and, and uh, Albert Collins and John Lee Hooker and uh, you know people like that. Um, a lot of jazz legends like Roy Haynes, uh, that has sat in with the Allman Brothers and, and um, uh, myself, Jimmy Cobb sat in with the Allman Brothers. Uh, these are cats who played with Charlie Parker and Miles Davis and Coltrane. That, uh, but for me, one of the heaviest for me was sitting in with Bob Dylan was, was uh, I, I still, have a mental picture of how I felt. Uh, uh, could you paint that for us? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, 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 wish, I wish I could. If, if I could do that, I'd be a painter. Um, but it was, it was amazing. It was, uh, it was, you know, we did this tour with Phil Lesh and Franz and Bob Dylan, and uh, it, was, it was great. Uh, and, and, and playing with him on stage was a, a huge thing for me. But I, I've been so fortunate that there's there's been so many people that I grew up listening to that I've been able to share the stage with, and, and it's not something I take for granted. Uh, this is a, a rather blunt question. Uh, are you a workaholic? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I am, but if I hated my job, I would not be. Um, that, that is, that's a really great answer also. <laughs> Um, who do you consider the best young guitarists who are un, who are less known, uh, you know, than some others at this time? That are less known. That would make me not know. Uh, <laughs> um, or know less about that. Yeah, like, yeah I, just I mean, maybe not worry about the less known part and just talk about. Well, how young is young? You know, I mean. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, young at heart. <laughs> young at heart. Um, there's this guy, Wes Montgomery. He was pretty, <laughs> pretty awesome. Um, I don't know. That's that's a tough one for me. Uh, there's so many. There's a lot of great young guitar players out there that are that are um, 
I think I'd have to think about that more. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a question on a, a, similar, a similar subject since uh, we bring up West Montgomery. Uh, tell me about some of your earlier influences, you know, Charlie Christian, Django Reinhardt, et cetera. Um, it would just be, do a, a quick synopsis. I, I started singing before I started playing guitar, so all my earliest influences were James Brown and Otis Redding and Wilson Pickett and the Four Tops and The Temptations and Sam and Dave. When I uh, heard Sly and the Family Stone, that started building this bridge toward Jimi Hendrix for me. And then hearing Cream and Hendrix and Johnny Winter and eventually the Allman Brothers and eventually every amazing guitar player from that fertile era was such a special thing to me. Then I started, uh, I discovered jazz and started listening to Sonny Rollins and Cannonball Adderley and Coltrane and Miles and Wes Montgomery and Django Reinhardt and Charlie Christian. and. Um, it's such a challenging art form. Like if you're gonna play jazz, you gotta, you gotta devote your life to playing jazz. And I was equally enamored with being a singer songwriter and being a, a soul singer and being a rock musician and a blues musician. So I, I didn't, I never devoted myself to being a jazz musician, but I always absorbed it through listening and through osmosis. And so the, the jazz philosophy has always been a huge part of everything that I do. Uh, and it's a huge part of what Government Mule does. Uh, but uh, I would never say, consider myself a jazz musician, but I'm someone who is very influenced by it. Do you feel like you're, I mean, since you, you know, uh, obviously started out as a singer. I mean, does, do you feel like that's affected your playing? I mean, as, as far as coming, in for, coming at it from the standpoint of, you know, having initially, you know, conceived of yourself as a vocalist? Absolutely. I, I think in so many ways, one being that the guitar players that I was instantly drawn to were either also singers or guitar players that sounded like they were singing through their instrument. I've always loved uh, guitar players that had that human vocal quality about what they play. Or the way Hendrix would often sing the line while he was playing it. Yeah, and, and, and that's an extension of uh, Delta Blues that he took to Mars, you know. But, uh, but Hendrix is a great example. As, uh, as outlandish as he was, you can sing his solos, you can hum his solos, uh, because they have that vocal quality about them. And a lot of it is not just the melodies, but the phrasing. And a lot of what phrasing is built around is the punctuation. Singers have to take a breath. So uh, that adds punctuation to the, what they're doing. Consequently, it just turns out that that sounds better when you pause in the middle of a phrase. So guitar players don't have to, but they should. And so, uh, uh, so I, I'm just uh, someone who loves to hear people that have that, that quality. You know, and I was thinking about it uh, recently when somebody asked me a, a kind of similar question. I thought, you know, if the notes you're playing are big and beautiful enough you don't have to play very many of them. And that's why B.B. King sounds so great. And it's the same with his voice. If, if someone can play a note or sing a note and you just hear that one note and it sounds beautiful, that's more important than 80% of everything else. Well, that was uh, fantastic. I wonder if uh, we can uh, hear one more song. Sure. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you.
Never wanted to be swept away I thought I might lose myself Nobody told me there'd be music Sweet music And now I got that sinking feeling And though I try to brace myself can feel me start to surrender, sweet surrender. Everything I needed to remember, everything I needed to forget. I see a smile I am a child I'm Never thought I could love someone More than I love myself Nobody told me about forgiveness Sweet forgiveness Now we're planting our seeds in the ground The ones we sow together We're waving our flag in the air Roots are growing Everything I needed to remember Everything I needed to forget When I see a smile I am a child I'm captured